I want to welcome those of you guys who are here live. I want to welcome those of you guys who are joining us online. I know it's a little different of an angle, but I want to say hi to you guys who are joining us online. I want to welcome you guys. Uh, if you can, help us out by hitting the like button to this video. It really helps us to be able to reach more people through uh, the YouTube platform and subscribe as well. Uh, and I also want to I want to welcome those of you guys who are here. I know we got a couple of new faces. I got we got a couple of other. I don't want to say old ones, but some ones that we haven't seen in a while. So, so glad to see you guys. Um, and we are going to get started today. I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Today we're finishing our series, uh, the series that we were calling Tough Questions. And uh, these are some questions that a lot of us ask, some questions that some of us may never have asked, but now you know the answer to them. Um, and these are questions found in Ephesians chapter 1. In these verses 11 through 14. And just to, to recap some of the passages and some of the questions that we've asked already, maybe you have asked your questions and you missed some of them. You can go back on our YouTube archive and check those out. But questions like, does God elect those who will be saved? Another question is, does God control all things? The answer is yes, by the way. Uh, and uh, last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we learned what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we, we've learned all this so far, and uh, today we are going to ask one final question in this passage, and I, I, I encourage you guys to join me in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read these two verses, starting in verse 13, and it says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked, everyone say marked, in him with a seal, with a seal, okay? The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of God his glory. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask you to help us to be able to understand and unpack this passage that you have given to us through your holy word. God, I ask you to enlighten us, to give us uh, humble hearts to understand what this says, God, and to be able to, through this understanding, have a deeper and richer relationship with you, God. And I thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We love to take notes here, so I'm going to ask you to write down the title of today's message, and the title is also a question, and this question is, can you lose your salvation? I don't know. We got, we got some reactions. Okay, can you lose your salvation? I know that's a, that's a question a lot of us might have. You know, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this, and uh, today, hopefully, we will clear some of this up, but I want to encourage you to keep an open mind. Uh, I, I want you to, 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 to forget, well, not forget, but to, to maybe put aside some of the things that you may have heard and some people say and some logical arguments and some things like that, because today we're going to look at the Word of God and we're going to see what the Bible tells us about this question. Can you lose? your salvation. And uh, based on what we have learned already, we've learned that God elects, you know, there's, there's a process of election and that we still have responsibility as humans. We are all sinful people. And we have learned already that God controls all things. So we are going to make the proposition, write this down, your proposition for today is this. God promises that true believers, that's, that's key, underline that if you can, if you're writing it down, underline that. God promises that true believers cannot lose their salvation. God promises that true believers cannot lose their salvation. Now, this is a loaded statement, okay? There's a lot of things in this one statement, and hopefully we're going to break this down and help you to understand it a little bit better. But a logical view of this passage or of, this, of, this, uh, of, of salvation is that if God is the one who saves us, he is the one who sustains us, right? If he is the one who is, has elected us, we cannot lose that election because it's up to him. However, 
This is a logical argument, and we know that our minds are wicked beyond all things. Our heart are wicked, and we cannot use logical arguments because our, logic, our human logic is flawed. And so we turn to Scripture and see what the Word of God has to tell us about this. And so we land here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And I want us to read it again, and there's some key words here that I need you to understand. It says, and you also, talking about Christians, people who believe, true believers, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, okay, when you received God as your Lord and Savior, when your life was transformed, when you received that Holy Spirit that we talked about, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Underline that word, that word seal. And uh, this is a business legal term. This seal is the equivalent of what we, would qual- uh, what we would call our signature, right? Back in those days, uh, they, didn't have, they, didn't, they didn't use signatures. And so what they would use is they would use these marks that would identify who the true sender was. Have you, got, you guys know what a signet ring is? Yeah, like, okay, there's like kings. They used to wear these massive rings, right? And it had a specific shape and a specific design on it. And what they would do is when they would sell, send a notice or they, when they would sell something to say, this is from the king, they would write a scroll and they would seal it with wax and they would put their signet ring, their seal on that thing so that if it was broken or if it was, if it was torn apart, you would know that it wasn't authentic. But if it was, the seal was there, and it was unbroken, then you knew this was from the king, all right? So God, in this passage, is telling us that you, your life, your eternal security is sealed with God. God has, God has sealed you. He has put his mark on you. He has signed. He has authorized. He's given you that permission slip. He has authorized you on his name. This is him who is authenticating your salvation. As a matter of fact, that that word seal is going to come up in the Greek. It's to set a seal upon, to mark with a seal or to seal. I mean, we're just saying the same thing over again. It's to mark you, to seal you. And so here is the first point I want you to write down. And this is important. Your salvation is in God's hands. Your salvation is in God's hands. And by extension, is in Jesus' hands as well. So your salvation is in God's hand. Let's keep reading that here. It says in verse 13, it says, You are also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. And what is that seal? The promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is put inside of you, his spirit is inside of every true believer. And now being marked with that Holy Spirit, his sign, his authorization for you. Now it says this, who is the Holy Spirit? Verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of of his glory. I want you to also underline that word, uh, deposit, because again, it is a commercial legal term. And uh, this word, it means the first installment. Okay, It doesn't just mean a deposit. Like sometimes, have you guys ever bought a house? Ever bought a car? Nobody? You guys bought a house? Raise your hands. Participation. Come on. If you're online watching, raise your hands. Put a little emoji. Hands up. There you go. All right. If you ever bought a house, bought a car, okay, good. You guys know that you have to sign, right, in order to to say that I am legally bound to this car. But also, in order to commit, to truly say that this is, I'm really into it, you have to pay, you have to sacrifice something into it, and you have to give a deposit, right, that guarantees it. Because if you back out, what happens? you lose your deposit, right? Now, we're not talking about a human being here. We're talking about God. And so he signs and he puts a deposit in you. And it is not only a, it doesn't only mean just a deposit. It's the first payment. The the word is actually written in a way that it, it, it implies continual 
payments, continual uh, um, putting into until that final day. It's a down payment. It's a pledge. Or in other words, it's a payment which obligates the contracting party to make further payments. So this is not just something that is a a payment, one-time thing, that's it. It means it's a promise, it's a sign, it's a seal, and it's a deposit guaranteeing our future. And if you, uh, we, we don't really have the time to go into it, but as we look at God, who is the one who promises, God is faithful. God is not like a human being who backs out on his word, who's going to leave his deposit behind, who, ah, that one didn't work out. No, he is the one who guarantees this. As a matter of fact, if it's an amazing story. If you want to write it down, you can read it on your own. We don't have the time. But in Genesis 15, God makes this promise to a man named Abraham. You guys have heard of Abraham, right? Yes? All right, so Abraham had many sons, many sons. Okay, Abraham was the father of the nations, right, of the nation of Israel. And God made a promise with him, and he used another legal term and stuff with them. And what he did was the way that they used to do it is they used to sign contracts, and they used to have to walk in between dead animals. It was gross. Thankfully, we don't do that anymore, but that's the way that they did it, and the way that it worked is that one person had to walk, and the other person had to walk, but God said, no, 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 no. Abraham, I'm going to put you to sleep, and this is going to be an unconditional promise. Nothing that you do, Abraham, is going to, or nothing that you do or don't do is going to make me break my promise, and God says his promise is faithful, and we still see the nation of Israel today. God has been faithful to this day because he upholds his promises. But not only do we see that in, other, in those parts of the Bible, but we also see this explicit, to, uh, this, this explicit in the word of God. I want you to look at John 3. John 3, 36 specifically. This is, uh, this is Jesus talking to a man named Nicodemus. It's, a, it's an amazing passage. In John chapter 3, you know, we, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Yeah, okay, so he, this is a continuation of all that. And he tells them this in verse 36. He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So I want you to look at that word eternal life. If you have eternal life, when does it end? It's eternal, right? So if you have eternal life, and then you lose that eternal life, was it eternal? No, because eternal implies an, 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 an insurmountable amount of time. It is eternal, you can't be eternal one day, then not be eternal the other day, then be eternal, and then I, 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 uh, I, I sin, and so I'm not eternal anymore, and then I did, and I, for, I asked God for forgiveness, and now I am eternal. You can't flip-flop, flip-flop between eternal life and eternal death. And again, it's a logical argument, but we see some more defenses in the Word of God. Look at John 6, a couple of passages afterwards, a couple pages afterwards. John 6, verses 38 through 40. It says this. For I, this is Jesus again speaking, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. You guys ready to hear the will of God for Jesus? You guys ready? Head nods? Say yes? Okay, good. All right, this is the will, okay? That I shall not lose none of all, did I say that right? That I shall lose None of all those he has given me, but will raise them up in the last day. And so we get this image, right? We get this image of God's hands. Everyone go like this with your hands, if you can, without dropping your phone, okay? So you are secure in God's hands. And by extension, you are secure in Jesus' hands. And so what he is saying is that the will of God is that he doesn't lose any of them, that none of them slip through his fingers. This is Jesus, that he holds 
every single one of his people in his hands. And another passage that says, except the one that was meant for perdition, which is Judas. We know about that guy, right? But that one was meant to come out. So, so these are the, the hands of Jesus, the hands of God, and we are secure and safe in his hands. Look at another passage. Look at John 10. Flip a couple pages. And in John 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd, and he identifies us as his sheep in his sheepfold. And look at what it says about himself being the shepherd. Verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 27. It says this, my sheep listen to my voice. Those of you who are true believers will listen to his voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And no one will what? will snatch them. Everyone say that. No one will snatch me. Uh, let's try that again. Say, no one will snatch me, no one will snatch me. out of Jesus' hands. There you go. All right. So we are secure in the hands of Jesus. It says, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. I and the Father are one. You see, we have security in the hands of God. Our salvation doesn't depend on us because if it did, we would lose it every day, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but sin is a real thing and sin comes at us all the time and it would be exhausting to go between being saved, not being saved, being saved, not being, it is just exhausting. But in the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus, no one can snatch you away. As a matter of fact, turn to Romans 8. I feel like we go to Romans 8 every single, uh, it's just such a good passage. It's a great chapter, Romans 8. Look at what it says, starting in verse 35. It's, it's, a, it's a great representation of what God does for us. Romans 8, uh, verse 35. It says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a rhetorical question, right? It says, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. No. I will say no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, I'm sorry, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our salvation is secure in the hands of God. Our salvation is in his hands and nothing that we can do will save us, and nothing that we can do will make us lose our salvation. But you got to remember our proposition, because this statement gives a lot of freedom to the true believer. And I could tell you, it's awesome to be a true believer because you have that freedom. However, there are some that will cling to this promise and will hold God to something that he never promised. Because a lot of people will say, oh, well, if, if all I got to do is say a prayer, if all I got to do is come to the front, if all I got to do is, is just raise my hand, then I'm saved. I'm good. I don't got to do anything else for the rest of my life. I'm secure in the hands of God. Jesus, I'm coming home. Right? And it's, it's like, it's like this, this, this mindset of, okay, I did this one time, and now I'm good for life. I'm secure. But you got to remember this promise is to true believers. So what is a true believer? Is it somebody who raises their hands or comes to the front or says a prayer? It's part of it. But a true believer is someone who recognizes they are sinners, recognizes that in our lives, us leading in our kingdom of our lives is going to lead us to hell. Us continuing in this path will not cause us to, to, to be good enough to get into heaven. There's only one person we can get into heaven through, and that's Jesus. 
And so we need to recognize that we are sinners. We need to repent from our sins, and we need to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Why? Because Jesus came to this earth. He died for our sins so that through his death, our sins could be forgiven. And through his resurrection, we could have eternal life. He is the only one we hold on to. And so we recognize that we cannot live our lives in the way that we once were living in our sins, and so we repent. Metanoia means to turn your mind, to turn the other way. And so no longer live in the direction you were going, but now follow after God and live under his reign in his kingdom. You are no longer the, the ruler of your life. When you are a true believer, God is the ruler of your life. And so how do we know who's a true believer or not? How do we know? Is it, is it, is it like, a, do we get a mark? Do we get like, a, like, a, like an ID? Do we get like a, a pass? Or, what do we have? How can we show that we are true believers? Write this down as point number two. Write this down as point number two. One proof of a true believer is perseverance. One proof of a true believer is perseverance. See, the Bible many times will relate our Christian walk as a race. It relates, in many passages, it says running the race with endurance and all this stuff. I have run the race. I have fought the fight. I have fought the battle, right? It's a race that we're running, right? But how many of you guys loved to race when you were little? Like you guys used to race against your friends. Okay, okay, I used to do that. But how it works, okay, is a race when you're little is that you got to go as fast as you can, right? And you got to run, 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 run so that the other person will lose and you will win, right? But that race is a sprint. And what happens after? You're just exhausted. You're just tired. You just can't. I just, I just, I need a breather. I just, I just can't do it anymore. I just, just give me a couple moments, right? before I run this race again. And so many times, we run this Christian race like that. We, we hear the word of God, and we're like, we got to run, we got to race, we got to be fast, we got to sprint. Look at that guy. Look at his life. I want to be just like that, and so I got to catch up. Look at that girl. Look at, her, look at how she reads her Bible. Look at how committed she is to God. Look at how they serve. I want to run just like that. And you run, and you run, and you run in your own strength. And what happens is, you get tired because you cannot run this Christian race in your own strength. This is not a sprint. As a matter of fact, we need to look at it more as a marathon. See, so many times we, you know, we, we, we begin and we're like, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to Christ. I'm going to serve. I'm going to pray. I'm going to commit to pr- reading five hours a day, and I'm going to pray for half an hour in the morning and then like 20 minutes in the afternoon. And then I'm not going to celebrate anything that's evil or anything like that, but I'm just going to be, I'm going to keep myself pure, and I'm going to do all this stuff, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And it's all about me and what I'm going to do. Who is still governing your life if you're in the the Amina? Yourself. You yourself are the one who's governing your life. And yes, all of those things are great, but it needs to be under the guidance and the will of God. He needs to rule your life. So yes, you should pray. Yes, you should read your Bible. Yes, you should do all these things. But sometimes we try to go so fast that we try to do things in our own strength and, and we are not listening to what God has to tell us. And sometimes it's as simple as read the Bible. Yeah, but I want to serve God. Read your Bible. Yeah, but I, I, got, I got to volunteer and I got to do this. I got... Read your Bible. Yeah, but I'm going to listen to a thousand messages. And I... Read <laughs> your Bible. Pray. Do, do the, the things that you need. You need to run this race with endurance. It doesn't come overnight. And so many times we get exhausted and frustrated because we've been trying to do this in our own strength, but we need to rely on the strength of the one who saved us because he saved us, he sustains us, but he carries us through the whole way. And so, and so we see that one of those proofs 
of a real Christian, of a true believer, is perseverance. Those who don't run in their own strength, who don't try to do this on their own, but rather depend on God. Look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 is a passage talking about the preeminence of Christ, how how, uh, powerful he is. Look at what it says in verse 21. Talking about believers, okay? or maybe not believers. It says, once you were alienated from God because, I'm sorry, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That was every single one of us in here, okay? Whether you're a Christian or not, you were once there. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. These are great promises. I'm so awesome. This is so awesome. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Here's what you need to realize. He's not writing this to to tell you, oh, this is conditional. You only have this if you persevere. He 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 is letting us know that He can't see your heart. Paul can't see your heart. I can't see your heart. I don't know what's going through your mind. Only God can. So he is making sure that people don't hold on to false promises. And so he's saying, you have freedom, you have have redemption, you have eternal life. If if you persevere, if if, if you truly show, if you truly are, a Christian, if you are a true believer. But if you don't, you don't have any of those things. You are, if you're not a believer, you don't have any redemption. You don't have, you don't have any of that stuff. And so he tells us, if you continue in your faith. See, so many of us might have a false sense of security. Some of us might, might think, yeah, that promise is for me. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm not... But you need to realize that the mark of a Christian, one of the marks of the Christian is perseverance. John, the Apostle John, one of the last to die. So he's writing this towards the end of his life. He tells us this in 1 John 2.19, an epistle he writes. He says, talking about believers who, who fell away, he says, they went out from us, meaning they left the faith, but they did not really belong to us. They weren't really part of, the, our, of, part of our people. They weren't really Christian. Why? For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. If they were truly believers, if they were true believers, they would have still been here. It says, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. See, sometimes we we, we, we get excited. We, We get we, we hear salvation, we hear forgiveness of sins, we hear eternal life, we hear hell, and we don't want any of that. And we, we want that. We want that for our lives, but yet it becomes hard. It's not an easy thing to be a Christian. And I can tell you personally that I have gone through this. See, I, I, I've told you guys this story many times, but when I was a little kid, I grew up in the church just like many of you guys. Some of you guys younger, some of you guys older. But I grew up in the church. I learned about God. I knew all the things about God. And, you know, I I wanted to serve God. I I was, I I did the the old school slides, you know, the overhead projector. You guys remember that? You guys are too, like, overhead, what what kind of century are you from? It was an overhead projector. You had to put these slides and you had to, like, put the next one. You got to go like that and you got to be quick with it. But anyways, so that was like, the. I used to serve God and I used to share the gospel. I used to do all that stuff. But it was on my own strength. Why? Because I thought I was a good kid. Because I thought, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm a good person. I get to serve God. I get to do all these things. But in my heart, in my heart, I still desired sin. I still desired to do evil. And so when I got the decision to, to make for myself, when I, when I got to choose, I decided to no longer serve God. I decided to no longer really follow the things of God. That was a, a childish thing that I did when I was little. And yet I could tell you that in that moment, I was never saved. I never had salvation. Why? Because I did not have that perseverance. I, wasn't, I was doing it out of my own strength. And when I got older, I realized life is long. I mean, sometimes it's not. But 
when you're when you're young, life is uh, you know I got so much. I got college. I got high school. I got so many things to do. So many fun things to participate in. I don't want to miss out because I'm a Christian. And so I didn't miss out, and I participated in those things. And it came to a point where I realized that since I had fallen away, I was never truly saved to begin with. And I want you to write that down as point number three. Those who fall away were never saved. Hear those stories about kids who grew up in the church and did all the stuff, and now they're in the world. It's a sad truth. But this is why we need to let you guys know this stuff from now. That you may not be saved. Just coming to church doesn't save you. I know it's hard to hear. I know it's hard to hear that some of the people who might be in this room, some of you guys who are watching online, people throughout the world who who go to church may not be saved. And this is not a scare tactic. I'm not trying to scare you or, or tell you anything that's, that's not in the Word of God. D- Jesus himself tells us this. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 7, one of the harshest passages in the Bible. And it's very sobering, as a matter of fact. So it, write the, look, look at Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read you the first part, and then I'm going to read you the second part. So Matthew chapter 7, look at what it says in verse 13. Jesus giving his Sermon on the Mount. You guys have heard that before. Great passage, all this stuff. And towards the end of it, he says this. Enter through the narrow gate. Everyone say narrow. It's a narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So as you think, oh, yeah, everyone's 30%, 40%, 50% of the the United States is Christian of the world. No, 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 no. People think they're Christian, but narrow is the road. Few will find it. Many people identify as Christian who are not, who do not truly have salvation. Jesus is saying, you are not going to be the majority. You are going to be a small minority. And many people who are in your churches who are saying, I have served, I have done, I have this, I have that, will not truly have salvation. Skip down to verse 21. Look at what he says here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, how much? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So many times we think of because of what we've done, because of what we said, because of who we, how many times we've come to church. Maybe you think because I raised my hand that one time, right? Or maybe because that that prayer that I said when I was a little kid. Or maybe it's because I serve, Pastor, I serve all the time. I'm I'm on the production team. I'm on the worship team. I'm I'm on the this team. I serve here and I do that. I'm on security team. I'm on all these teams. I, I I've done so much stuff for God. Maybe you say, you know, I got baptized. I was baptized. That's like, that's like showing everybody that I'm saved, you can be baptized and not saved. Maybe it's because you got that feeling, you know, that little feeling when you came forward, like, oh, yeah, I just, it was like that song was playing. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, the Father's arms are open wide. Everyone's just coming. And it's like that feeling, I, I just, I know I had it because that, that feeling that I once had. Or maybe how passionate I was when I first started. I was serving. I was sharing the gospel. I was doing all these things. Let me tell you. All those things are good. Those, don't, don't get me wrong. Those, those are good things. But if there was never any transformation in your heart, then you may not be a true believer. And you might think that your salvation is secure, but it truly is not. And so how do we know? How do we know if we are or not? I want to take you to another passage. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. 
And in this passage, it's actually one of the, the most common passages that, that people use to talk about that you can lose your salvation. But I want you to read it in context, because if you read it in context, you, you, you realize that's not what it's saying at all. All right, so go to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 4, okay? It says this, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. So, wait, does that mean you can lose your salvation? Does that, does that mean that you, can, that you can lose your salvation? Well, let's keep reading, all right? Keep reading. Verse uh, 6. There, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Verse 7, land, now he gives an analogy, okay? He gives you an image of what he's talking about. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is being farmed receives the blessing of God. So rain falls, stuff grows, and it's good. It's some good stuff. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So you get an image here. It's talking about two kinds of lands. One land that, that, that is fruitful and one land that is, gives thorns and thistles. Same God, same people who are in church receiving the word of God, praising God, raising a hallelujah and all this stuff. But, but there's good soil and then there's bad soil. You guys remember the, the parable of the soils, the four different soils? Yeah, three of those, not saved. One is, okay? And that's only the one that produced fruit. So here, he, the, the author of Hebrews is not telling you that you can lose your salvation. He's saying those of you guys who are sitting in church, who are not truly saved, you're not going to be saved. Look at verse 9. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case for those who are true believers. The things that have to do with your salvation. Verse uh, 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped the people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. Perseverance. Keep going. Keep serving. Keep following after God so that what you hope for may be fully realized. He finishes off by saying, we don't want you to be, become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what is being promised. So he is saying that there are people in the church. There are people who are going to participate, people who, are, who might be serving alongside of you, who, who have tasted, who hear the goodness of God, but may not truly be saved. People who don't truly have this heart transformation. And I know we've been, it's a lot of scary stuff, a lot of gloom and doom, and this, this, this should be heavy. This should, the word of God is, is heavy. It's, it's giving you a reality check. And so what do we do in light of this? How can we know? Because I know some of you guys who are true believers are not like, wait, am I even saved? Like, do I, am I, am I even part of, like, am I even a Christian? But I want, you, I want you to do something, all right? Write this down as your application. I want you to write this down as your application. Test yourselves. Test yourselves. I cannot tell you if you're a Christian or not. I can kind of see the signs, but I can't tell you if you're truly saved or not. No one can tell you that in this room. Only God knows. So, actually, only two people know, God and yourself, because you, you know the motives of your heart. And so, test yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So the Apostle Paul is telling us to test ourselves to see if we truly are believers. So how do we do that? It's like a COVID test. Do we get like false positives? Like how does that how does that work? Well, this is more accurate than that, all right? So write this down as, as, as your application, as your first question to ask yourself. Where does my testimony end? 
What is my, when you share your story with people, when you share how God has changed and transformed your life, when does it end? Does your testimony start? Oh, yeah, when I was a little kid, I went to church and I followed God and, you know, we served and we did all that stuff and, you know, my life was transformed. That's it. You're 34, man. Like, <laughs> like, that's all God did for you when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, God transformed my life when I was a kid. And, and what, what else has he done in your life? We need to have an up-to-date testimony. Like, God, last week, do you know what God did in my life? God refreshed me and restored me. And do you know who I spoke to this? We should have a testimony that's ongoing. And if we, somebody asks to share a testimony, we got to keep updating. It's like a resume, right? Like, we got to just keep adding and adding things that God has done in our lives. Why? Because this shows us whether or not this was a faith we once had or it's a faith that we truly have in our life today. We need to see each and every week God at work in our lives, every day if possible. And if you don't see that, then ask God to show you. Maybe you've been living for a long time with you as the head of your life. You need to stop that and defer your, the lead of your life, the kingdom, the role, the authority to God. Allow him to lead your life. Second question to ask yourself is, am I obeying his word? Obviously, this implies, are you reading his word, right? But this, this also means, are you obeying his word, what it says? Jesus tells us, uh, or John tells us this in 1 John 2. It says, whoever says, I know him. Yeah, I know God. I know Jesus. I know that guy. I know he, like, I see him on the cross all the time. I, like, I know that guy. But does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Do you want to know if you're in Christ or not? Do you want to know if you're in Christ or not? Ask, look at this, what it says. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If I was to put a side-by-side -side comparison of you and Jesus, how, how good would you fare? Uh, probably not very good. But if I, was to put, if I was to put a picture of your old self and your new self, how would that fare? Do you, and I'm not talking about like physically, right? I'm not talking about those weight loss pictures. I'm, I'm talking about like, like, like who you are as a person. Is it the same person? Or are you becoming more like Christ? Are, is your trajectory changing? Are you becoming more like Jesus? Is there evidence in your life? As a matter of fact, that's the third question. Is fruit evident in my life? Is fruit evident in my life? And I know to people who outside of the church may not understand fruit. What are you talking about? Are we going to the supermarket? Well, okay. So the, so the Bible uses fruit as an analogy to show that things that come out of us, what, what's being put in, things come out. And the fruitfulness, John 15, uh, John 15, Jesus says this, remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It's giving an analogy of fruit. A fruit, a, a branch can't just give fruit. It says it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you are not in Jesus, you cannot be a fruitful Christian. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So what's this fruit? Well, we look at that in Galatians 5. Galatians 5 is known as the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits. By the way, you've been lied to if you know that it was a fruits. It's not plural. It's one fruit, all right? So those of you guys who made projects with like a whole bunch of different fruit, you've been lied to, all right? It's one fruit, all right? These are the characteristics of this fruit, all right? It says, but the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Right? It's, it's, it's a attitude, it's a change in your life, who you are becoming. Are you becoming more like this or are you becoming less like this? If you are attached to Christ, if you truly are in him, then you are becoming more like this. 
if you are not attached to the vine and you're trying to be that out of your own strength, you're becoming less like this. And the last question, actually, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to finish it up right now. And the last question is this. Am I spiritually growing? Am I spiritually growing? When you look at your life, are you becoming more like Jesus? Are you developing? Are you, are you having a deeper understanding of the word of God? Are you still that same person you once were when you gave your life to Christ? Are you spiritually growing? Peter gives us an image of what this looks like. This is the last passage I'm going to ask you to turn to. 2 Peter 1. That one's hard to find, so it's going to come up on the screen. So look at 2 Peter 1. Peter writing this, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance Godliness, this is like a list, like a to-do list of how to become more of a Christian. You know, if, if you have no idea where to start becoming a Christian, start with goodness. Then start with knowledge. Then add self-control. Then add perseverance. Then add godliness. To godliness, mutual affection. To mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, if you're growing in these areas, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Verse 10, skip over to uh, verse 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to conform, to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, I want to bring a challenge to you. Because sometimes we might think that we have an eternal security. And yes, we are safe in God's hands. You'll never fall away. Yes, we sin. Jesus forgives us. We are in his hands. Nothing can take us away. But are you already in his hands? That's the question. If you're in his hands, you cannot, you, you cannot go out. You, you can't not lose your salvation. We already established that. However, the question is, are you in his hands? Are you saved? It's a question that only you can answer. It's a question that only God can answer for you. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, today, actually, Mark's, uh, I forget how many days, but today is actually not just... Uh, there's other celebrations, but today's actually Reformation Day. I don't know if you guys know that. But Reformation Day is, is a day where, where uh, Martin Luther and all of them, they, they began the Reformation movement, and they realized that salvation is through Christ alone, through faith alone, through grace alone, it to, all to God's glory. And I forget the last one. And all in his, to, to, through his word. All right? And they, 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 they started this Reformation movement that we still continue till today. We continue to believe that in Christ alone is where our hope is found. We cannot lose that. But the question is, are you in Christ? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and I'm going to pray in this moment. God, thank you for the message of your word. God, I ask you that your word does not come back void. You promise that it won't, God. You know, we know that your word is effective. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides joints and marrow, soul and spirit, God. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. God, and may your word do that work today. May your word penetrate deep into our hearts and help us to realize whether we are truly in your hands or whether we're just playing church whether if we truly have salvation and eternal security or if one day you will tell us, I never knew you. God, help us to recognize this. Help us to be honest to ourselves today and recognize that without you, we are nothing and that it takes surrender. It takes submission. 
and it takes repentance. So God, today, work in the hearts of the people who are here. Work in the hearts of the people who are watching us online. God, if you have touched any heart today, may they come to the realization that they need you. May they recognize that they are sinners far from you and they need your salvation. How you came, how you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins so that we can have our sins paid for. We hold on to that. And your word promises those who call on your name will be saved. If we declare with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts, truly believing in our hearts, that you raised him from the dead, we will be saved. God, we hold on to that promise and we just ask you to give us that assurance today. God, do a work in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I don't want to give you any false sense of security. So I don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I don't want you to mark this day in your calendar as the day that I gave my life to Christ because you know what? I, I don't want you to hold on to that. I want you to ask yourself those four questions. Are you... Where does your testimony end? I want you to ask yourself, am I following and obeying God's word? Am I growing and showing fruit? And am I, am I developing as a believer? Ask yourself those questions. And if you're not, and you do want to start that relationship, then come see me after the service. I'll be right here, and I, I could help you uh, in that journey. I can help start you on that journey. But with that said, today we're going to stand up. Church, you can stand up at this moment. We're going to continue to praise God.